our Bibles tonight, and we'll go to, if I remember how to open this thing, we'll go to Ephesians uh, chapter number one. <clears throat> I warned you before that I love the book of Ephesians, and so uh, I love to get back there anytime I have opportunity. So uh, Ephesians chapter one. I love uh, <clears throat> going back and, and studying these passages uh, over and over again because you just the more you dig, the more you the more truth you find in it, the more gold nuggets you find. And um, and the scripture I want to share with you tonight, I hope, <clears throat> will be a, a an encouragement. Uh, hope it'll be a blessing. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, we preachers can get so focused on the negative and trying to find everybody's problems and correct everybody's problems, uh, that we lose sight of some of the really thrilling things that the Bible teaches, and, and I don't want to, uh, to do that. <clears throat> uh, I certainly don't want to gloss over some of the rich things that we find here in Ephesians 1. And so we're going to read just one verse uh, tonight, Ephesians 1 and verse number 6. And so let's go ahead and stand if you would, <clears throat> once you've found it there. And let's go ahead and read verse number six <clears throat> together tonight. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to study your word. And Lord, I pray as we look at this uh, <clears throat> important topic, Lord, this um, simple idea, uh, that Lord, you would help us to take it to heart. Help us, Lord, as we uh, just give a few moments to meditate on this verse uh, that, Lord, we would allow it to not just get into our minds, but into our hearts. And, Lord, that you'd help us to understand what it means to be accepted in the beloved. Uh, speak to us now, we pray. Lord, uh, Lord, I pray that you would grant me uh, liberty and, Lord, power to preach your word. And, Lord, just please speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can have a seat. <clears throat> in uh, the Atlanta <clears throat> Journal-Constitution, Doug Cummings um, wrote this. He said, Lonnie J. Edwards, a physical education instructor, was explaining square dancing to his fifth grade class at Hooper Alexander Elementary School. Do you guys even know what square dancing is in California? Okay, you guys know what square dancing is. <laughs> that actually is the state dance of Illinois. So in public school, we had to learn some of those ridiculous moves. But, uh, so if you want to know what do se do means, uh, I used to know. I won't tell you because I can't remember. But anyway... Um, <clears throat> But, uh, but anyway, they were teaching this in class uh, in Hooper Alexander Elementary School in DeKalb County in Georgia. Uh, as he called the children to their places, boy, girl, boy, girl, Nancy, a little red-headed girl, said she was not coming. She started to cry and walked away, <clears throat> carrying a towel over her hands. Edwards approached the 12-year-old child cautiously. With her back to the other students, Nancy privately revealed why she couldn't possibly hold hands with boys. She had been born with only her pinkies and two partial fingers. Amazingly, she had hidden her deformity from teachers. She was able to hold a pencil, but the students knew all about it, and they were cruel to her. Gathering himself, Edward said, Nancy, we can't do anything about this problem, <clears throat> but I can help you overcome it and become the best you that you can be. Now, I want you to hold your head up. From this moment on, you will no longer use this as a limitation. Slowly, Nancy gave him the towel, <clears throat> which he never returned. And four days later, Edwards began the square dance as Nancy's partner. Soon all the children seemed willing, even eager, to touch Nancy's hands. That was in 1971. Over the next <clears throat> two years, Edwards continued to encourage her. Today, Nancy Miller, <clears throat> 38 at the time of this article, um, can do almost anything she sets her mind to, <clears throat> including play the piano, type about 65 words a minute, <clears throat> and married, she lives in Orlando with her husband and four children. She said, I grew up because of one man. And you know, life can be very difficult <clears throat> when we don't feel accepted. And uh, we, we, there's many things that might cause us to feel that way. Uh, might be something to do with our childhood and all that, you know, psychologists might try to help us figure it out. Um, but I think we've all, you know, known what it feels like to be the outsider. 
uh, to, to be the one that just doesn't fit in, the one that uh, doesn't feel like you're very well liked or like you're, you're welcome. Uh, <clears throat> but tonight, I want you to understand that this scripture that we just read is, is true of each and every one of us that are saved. That He, God the Father, hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Now, as we look at the scripture tonight, first of all, I want you to notice the person of the Savior. Notice the way Jesus is described in this verse. We have this, this title of the beloved. And uh, I think if you're saved and you read this scripture, I'm sure you realize that that's who it was talking about. But, uh, but let's go ahead and prove it uh, for a moment tonight. We don't want to just guess at it. Um, who is the beloved? Well, in Matthew 3 and verse 17, uh, God himself spoke from heaven and said, uh, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And again, in Matthew 17 and verse 5, we read, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And this is on the Mount of Transfiguration. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. You see, Jesus tonight is the beloved. Now, we are sons of God by adoption. We, we saw that, uh, uh, I guess it was back before Christmas, uh, looking at some of the previous verses here. Um, but he is a son by uh, eternal generation. He is eternally the Son of God and uniquely God's beloved Son. And because of this relationship, He is one whom the Father has loved, now think about this, from all eternity with a perfect love. If you could travel all the way back into eternity past, you would find God the Father perfectly loving the Son. And as you look forward to the eternity future, you'll find that that love will never change. He is uniquely God's beloved Son. Now in verses 1 through 5 here in, in chapter 1, let's go ahead and, and review it here. In verse 1, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful, notice it, in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it's like he just loves saying the name Jesus Christ. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And then our text, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And so in verses 1 through 5, Paul here repeatedly uses the names and titles of Christ and Jesus, the terms that we're familiar with. But in verse number 6, when it comes time to talk about Jesus and throw his name out there again, although Paul delights in using that name over and over again, he makes a deliberate change. And he says that we are accepted, not in Jesus Christ, not in Christ Jesus, not in the Lord Jesus Christ, or any other combination that he could have chosen, but he chooses an entirely different title, that we are accepted in the Beloved. There's a reason Paul did that. There's a reason God impressed upon his heart and gave him these words. It was to catch our attention. It was to draw our notice to it. Because he's concerned, as Martin Lloyd-Jones said, to bring out its full force and intensity, what is, after all, the most wonderful thing of all about, about this great salvation. Now, in the, in the first five verses, we've already looked at some great things about salvation. I mean, being, uh, you know, God's elect and, and, and you know, <clears throat> being uh, uh, set apart to be holy and all these things. It, it's, it's some wonderful, wonderful truth about our salvation. But here we get to something that's even greater, that we are in the beloved. It's wonderful that we should be made holy. It's wonderful that we are adopted as sons. But most wonderful is the way that God has done it that we are in the Beloved. 
And so first of all, we want to note this evening, the person of the Savior, that He is the Beloved. But secondly, notice our, our position if we're saved. If you're saved tonight, and that is a big if. And I know this is a Sunday night crowd, and we can sometimes assume that everybody here is born again by the Spirit of God, and you know that Jesus is your Savior, and you know that you have eternal life. I hope that that is true. But I don't want to presume upon that. But if you are saved, the Bible tells us here our position is that we have been made accepted in the Beloved. Now again, have you ever, mel uh, have you ever felt uh, left out? I know oftentimes growing up, you know, I went to public school and, you know, in a Christian school it's a little bit better because kids are at least taught to be nice. But in public school, kids aren't taught to be nice anymore. And uh, sometimes you can feel quite rejected. It can be very difficult. But I think we've all been through that where we aren't wanted or at least we don't feel wanted. We feel rejected. We feel unloved. And if that's you tonight, <clears throat> then this verse is for you. God's personal message to you. Now it's true that there's nothing acceptable about us. All right, There's nothing acceptable about me. All right, Romans 3.10 says there is none righteous. No, not one, right? None of us measures up to God's standard. There's none of us that deserves His merit. There's none of us that deserves His favor. There's none of us that deserves eternal life or any of His goodness. There's nothing acceptable about us. Romans 3.23, of course, tells us why. For all have sinned and come short of that glory of God. And so there's nothing acceptable about us. But if we're saved, we are accepted in Christ. Now this is the basis of what we call the doctrine of eternal security. One of the reasons I can never lose my salvation is because I am in Christ. And God can't send Christ to hell. I'm in Him. How could God ever pour out His wrath upon His own Son again? We're safe in Him. I like what one Christian author uh, shares a testimony. Uh, this particular fellow was a, a former chaplain to the U.S. Senate. Um, but he, he tells about a, a time when he was in, uh, in Bible college. He said, my formative years ingrained the quid pro, quo, uh, quid pro quo into my attitude toward myself. Do and you'll receive. Right? How often do we get that thinking in our mind? If I, if I you know... If I uh, obey my parents, then they'll love me. Or if I, if I do good enough, then I'll finally uh, get what I want. You know, we get that thinking into our minds sometimes, and it's not right. Um, but but, but he, he learned to, to think that way. Uh, you know, perform and you'll be loved and so on. He said, when I got good grades and achieved and was a success, I felt acceptance from my parents. My dad taught me to fish and hunt and worked hard to provide for us, but I rarely heard him say, I love you. He tried to show it in actions, and sometimes I caught a twinkle of affirmation in his eyes, but I still felt empty. And uh, parents, just, just want to encourage you, make sure your kids know you love them. Make sure they know that you accept them for who they are. Uh, I, I think we probably touched on this when we were talking about child training, but um, you know, they're not going to be just like you. That, that's probably a good thing. Amen. Uh, but, uh, but accept them for who they are and make sure that they know that you love them for who they are. But anyway, uh, so he goes on. He says, I felt empty. And so he was a postgraduate student at the University of, of Edinburgh. And he said, because of financial pressures, I had to accordion my studies into a shorter than usual period. Carrying a double load of classes was very demanding. And I was exhausted by the constant feeling of never quite measuring up. No matter how good my grades were, I thought I could be be they could be better. Sadly, I was not living the very truths that I was studying. Although I could have told you that the Greek words for grace and joy are charis and kara, I, could not ex or I was not experiencing them. Then he says, my beloved professor, Dr. James Stewart, some of you may be familiar with his name, that slightly built dynamo of a saint, he calls him saw into my soul with x-ray vision. One day in the corridor of New College, he stopped me. He looked me in the eye intensely. Then he smiled warmly, 
took my coat lapels in his hands, drew me down to a few inches from his face, and he said, Dear boy, you are loved now. And I think some of us need that. Some of us need to have God just grab hold of our coat lapels and pull his clothes and say, Son, I love you. And that's what this verse is about. God loves us now. Not when we get better. He loves us now, as we are. We are accepted in the beloved. We will be accepted into heaven. We are accepted as God's children today, and we are accepted as we draw nigh to God in prayer. What a wonderful truth! I am accepted in the beloved. We say, well, preacher, what about my unacceptable behavior? I know I sinned. Boy, I feel guilty about that. I feel like the Lord is is, is mad at me and He's not going to hear my prayers. Well, let's be honest with ourselves. We do sin. We do fall short. We do mess up. We do sometimes even deliberately turn aside into evil ways. And it does have an effect on us. We're still His child. We're still in Christ. But it breaks our fellowship with Him. It hinders His grace from doing all that He desires to do in our lives. And so what do we need to do? Well, simply we need to repent of our sin, turn from it, and confess it to Him. He promises, and we should know the verse well, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have you ever thought about what it means that He's faithful and just? He's faithful. That means every time you come to Him with that contrite heart saying, Lord, I am sorry, I messed up again, He'll forgive you every time. And not only is He faithful, but He's just. He has the right to do it, and it's not wrong for Him to do it because Jesus paid it all for our sin. And so our sin will break our fellowship, but if we confess it, He'll restore us. And if we put ourselves in that position of being a disciple, one who is learning from Him, it'll take time. But God will take us from where we're at, and He'll lead us step by step to become what He wants us to be. And that's a wonderful thing. And sometimes I think people come into a a church like ours where everybody already knows how to dress, and everybody already is familiar with the songs, and everybody already knows some of the, some of the prayer language, you know, and, and uh, it can be overwhelming for a new Christian. It can be overwhelming for a visitor and think, man, I'll, I'll never become like them. And we need to often remind them of God's grace, that He takes us where we're at and He leads us one step at a time to become exactly what He wants us to be. Now, <clears throat> What is meant by this statement that we are accepted in the beloved? Well, it means that He has made us accepted. That we weren't accepted before. We were enemies of God. We were, we were separated from God. We were under His wrath. We were on our way to hell. But now something has changed. We have been made accepted. All right, it means that He receives us. He receives us. Um, if I were to go to Washington, D.C., and stand at the gates of the White House and say, I demand to see the president. Chances are he would not receive me. All right, he would not accept me. He would say, you know, I'm too busy. I don't don't have room in my schedule. I don't even know who this guy is. Why would I want to talk to him? But God doesn't treat his children that way. If you're saved tonight, you are accepted in the beloved. But you know, it's even more than what we think of as just being received or accepted. It means that it gives us a special honor. We are accepted in the beloved. What that means is that the love that that God showers upon Jesus, He loves us with that same love. God (laughs) intends to love us even as His Son was loved. Now, it may seem like too much to say. Now, think about it. We, we, earlier, we talked about how in eternity's past, 
and in eternity future, God has and always will love His Son with a perfect love. But God loves you and me with that same love. Because we are accepted in that beloved one. Now, it might seem like too much. <clears throat> but is it? Is it more than what the Bible is telling us here? Am I exaggerating? Well, listen to what Jesus himself said in John 17, verse 23. He said, I am them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. I don't think our minds can fully wrap around that. <clears throat> I mean, think about we as parents, how we love our children. I mean, it's hard to compare that. Uh, it, it, it would be hard for us to take that love and then love somebody else's kid that way. All right, it's, it's hard to do that. But God says, with this perfect love that I've loved my son with perfect unity throughout all of eternity, now I love you because I'm accepting you in him. I don't think I could believe it if God had not said it so plainly. Not only are we legally adopted as God's son, but the father loves us as he loved his son, Jesus Christ himself. Colossians 3.12 says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. He uses that very term. He says the word accepted in the beloved in Ephesians and in Colossians he says you are the beloved. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 he says, but we, be, uh, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. So again, Paul emphasizes it to us. We are beloved of God. It's been well said, the Son of God became the Son of Man, that the sons of men might be made the sons of God. And I don't think we give enough thought to that simple idea <clears throat> that Jesus came to earth and suffered all that He suffered, not just to save us from hell, but to make us God's beloved sons. <clears throat> In the whisper test, uh, Mary Ann Bird writes about her own testimony. She said, I grew up knowing that I was different, and I hated it. I was born with a cleft palate, and when I started school, my classmates made it clear to me how I looked to others. A little girl with a misshapen lip, crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and garbled speech. When schoolmates asked, what happened to your lip? I'd tell them I had fallen and cut it on a piece of glass. Somehow it seemed more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to have been born different. I was convinced that no one outside my family could ever love me. There was, however, a teacher in the second grade that we all adored, Mrs. Leonard by name. She was short, round, a happy, <clears throat> sparkling lady. And finally, or annually, we had a hearing test. And the way they did it in those days is <clears throat> she would... Uh, the teacher would, would give this class to everyone in the or give this test to everyone in the class. She would whisper something in their ear and see if they heard it. Uh, she said, "I knew my <clears throat> I knew from uh, past years that as we stood against the door and covered one ear, the teacher sitting at her desk would whisper something, and we would have to repeat it back. Things like the sky is blue, or do you have new shoes, or whatever." And so I waited for those words that God must have put into her mouth. Those seven words that changed my life. Mrs. Leonard said in her whisper, I wish you were my girl. And God says to every one of us that are deformed by sin tonight, I wish you were my son. I wish you were my daughter. And if you are saved tonight, He loves you and He's glad that you are His child. And He's got a wonderful plan for you. And so let's look thirdly at the plan of salvation. Because God always has a plan. Here in our verse we have it expressed this way, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the blood. Notice that word wherein. What's that, what's that pointing back to? 
Well, it's pointing back to that word grace. So he says that in God's grace, He made us accepted in the beloved. You see, salvation, of course, is a gift. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and then not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Most of us could quote that verse. But I wonder, is there some here tonight that have not received that gift of salvation? You see, salvation is all of grace. There's nothing you or I could have done. And there's nothing that you or I could ever boast in or be proud of. It's all of God's grace. But when we say yes to the Lord Jesus, and we receive Him as our Savior, He makes us His accepted in Jesus. Number four, notice the purpose of God in saving us. He says it's to the praise of of the glory of His grace. The first part of the verse there. Why does God save us by His grace? Why does God make us uh, in His beloved and accept us? It's to the praise of the glory of His grace. This is the why. This is the reason for it all. Why did God create man knowing that Adam would sin? So that eventually His grace could be seen. So that eventually He could receive praise for reaching down to us and saving us. Why did God bother to devise a plan by which to save us? Certainly it wasn't because man wanted it or because man asked for it. Look at verses 12 and verse 14 here in our text. He says again, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. It's all about bringing glory to Him. That's the purpose in it all. And so again, we should praise God the Father because He planned the church. We saw that in verses 3 through 6. We should praise God the Son who purchased the church. Verses 7 through 12 emphasizes that. And we should praise God the Spirit for protecting the church. We see that a little bit in verses 13 and 14. But again, in chapter 2 and verse 7, he says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. You see, the salvation that we taste of here in this life, and the Holy Spirit is the earnest or down payment, kind of a, a foretaste of that glory divine that's coming in the future. It, but that's all it is, is just a little taste of what's coming. He says he's, gonna, he's going to, uh, in the ages to come, show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And so it's all about bringing glory to Him. And as he demonstrates his kindness, as he demonstrates his forgiveness, as he demonstrates his grace in lifting us up from being enemies of God to not just, not just being forgiven, but being accepted and received as his only beloved son, it's all that he might get the glory. You see, the essence of sin is that we don't want to give God the glory that's due to him whether it's by not being obedient to Him, because our obedience glorifies Him, or not being thankful, as Romans 1 warns, was just the beginning of that downfall into the most heinous of sins. We must give the glory to Him. And so by making us children, He reveals His love and His grace. But not only children, He makes us holy. He makes us Obedient children, if you will. That's what God's grace is trying to accomplish in us. And God then reveals the glory of His holiness through us. And so what's the conclusion tonight? Well, we ought to rejoice. Rejoice in the fact that you are accepted of God. We ought to relish the opportunity to get to know Him better through His Word. And we ought to reflect His glory by allowing Him to work in our lives. We need to receive His grace so that we can become what He wants us to be. 
And hopefully His goodness will lead us to repent of our selfish living, our pandering to the flesh, that we might do His will, to walk with Him daily, to work for Him in the church, and to witness for Him to all those around us that still need Christ. And so tonight, <clears throat> do you love Christ? Is He your beloved? He is the beloved because God the Father loves Him. But He ought to be our beloved as well. And how do we demonstrate our love for Him? Is it not by keeping His commandments? I wish I could put a realization of these truths into each and every heart tonight. That we would recognize our position in Christ. That we are in the beloved. And all the privilege and all the opportunity that that sets before us. All the love that's being demonstrated and shown uh, to us. And, and, and man, you know, sometimes we're so hesitant to, to just find God's will and do it. Uh, but God has a plan for us because He loves us so much. And so I wish I could put a real love of God in your heart. Will you let Him do it? Will you let Him open your eyes to understand what it means to be accepted in the Beloved and stir in you a love so that Christ will be your Beloved as well? How long will you resist? How long will you miss out on His richest and best blessings? And then let me give you this question as well. Everybody here tonight that is saved is accepted in the Beloved. But are they accepted to us? They're accepted to God, but are they accepted to us? Do we love them? <clears throat> we really need to think about that. <clears throat> the church is a place that, that preaches God's grace, but that grace needs to be seen in each and every one of us. As people come in that maybe look a little different, maybe obviously have come from a very different background, <clears throat> they ought to receive real love from us. We ought to love them to Christ. And once, we're, once they're saved, we ought to welcome them as a, as a brother. We need to learn to accept those that God has accepted. And we don't accept their sin, I think you know that. <clears throat> But we need to accept God's children, those that have been saved by the grace of God, and encourage them to come along with us as we try to accomplish something great for Him. Let's go ahead and have heads bowed and eyes closed tonight. Do you realize that God accepts you tonight? Maybe there's somebody here that needs to be saved. Maybe there's somebody here that's still not accepted of God because you, you have not come His way. You have not received Christ as your Savior. You haven't turned to Him and, and let Him save you. If that's you, I hope that you'll come and let us show you from the Word of God how you can be saved tonight. God's promises are clear. And God will gladly save you if you'll receive Him. But if you're here and you're saved... You are accepted in the Beloved. That ought to cause us to rejoice. That ought to thrill our soul. It ought to stir us to, to want to spend time with Him in prayer and to go forth to serve Him. And so I hope you'll let Him challenge you tonight. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this day. We thank You, Lord, for the truth of this Scripture. And Lord, I do pray You'd help us to really take it to heart. Lord, if there's somebody here that is conscious of their sin and, and does not have the assurance that they've been born again, please convict them and draw them. Help them to be willing to come talk to somebody who can help them. But Lord, those of us that are saved, help us to shake off all those uh, guilty fears of the past and, and, uh, and things. Lord, help us to realize we are accepted in you. Lord, if there's some unacceptable behavior that we need to confess and turn from, Lord, help us to do it. That, Lord, we might rejoice in that wonderful relationship we have with you. That we might experience your love 
being shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Lord, please work now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.